Thank you. And thank you, Tilda, so much for your generosity and giving us this time. My honor and my pleasure <laughs> to sit with you. <laughs> um, I, I should say that Tilda and I have known each other a while because we met initially at Sundance when we were both on the jury at Sundance in 2003. And we met, as many jurors do, in a van uh, on our way to an event or from an event. And um, Leslie just unearthed a photograph of that moment, which unfortunately yeah. we can't, well, happily yeah. we can't blow up on the screen for you to see. But it's, uh, it take, it's a kind of gruesome sight. It is. We've, we, we, we've, we've, we've grown a little bit more put together, I think, <laughs> as, as, we've, as we've gotten older. Um, but I, I think um, the experience I remember at Sundance, and that was your first year that you ever went to Sundance, is that right? Because you had had films there, but you had never gone. I can't recall. remember. I, let's say yes. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, no, you're right. I think I hadn't been there in the flesh, but the films had been there. Yeah. yeah. And um, this is, we're going to hopefully, many of you will come, we'll go later tonight at 9 o'clock to see uh, Eternal Daughter. Uh, that's your 11th film here at, at the New York Film Festival. I don't know if you've been counting. We have. We've been <laughs> counting. Um, and I will say that your first film, do you remember, 1993, Blue, with, with Derek? I, I'll um, just say yes to everything. I okay. can't remember anything. <laughs> Isn't, wasn't wasn't uh, the last of England earlier than that? Even? No, the last of England um, was a little later, actually. Okay, it was in 1998. Okay, really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's what my folks tell me. I wrote it down from our database, so I hope so. Maybe I should put my glasses on to make sure I'm not reading the dates wrong. But no, look, it's correct. Yeah. Um, but let's you just say tonight's the first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, actually, what I want to talk to you about, though, is, is the experience of screening films at festivals, because it is a somewhat unique experience, I think, for, for artists, uh, and particularly film artists, the opportunity to, to screen, at a, particularly at a festival like this, where it's curated, obviously, Sundance, you know, hundreds of films uh, submitted, you know, several films selected. You had 18, you've had 18 films at Sundance that you've appeared in, so that's also impressive. Um, but maybe if you could, what, how do you feel about coming to these festivals and sharing it with the festival audience as opposed to the sort of premiere screenings that you might have to do otherwise? You know, film festivals are, um, they're, they're really my church, to be honest, because if it hadn't been for going to, the Berlin Film Festival with the first film I ever made, uh, which was Caravaggio with Derek Jarman in 1764, I think. <laughs> um, um, I not only um, would I not have uh, discovered the world of film as, a, as an international filmmaker, but also as a film audience. I mean, it was a real uh, total kind of revelation to me, the way in which film festivals work, because um, we know, all of us, all of us film nerds and those of us who go to film festivals uh, know the particular pleasure of going to see a film that you know pretty much nothing about. And you don't care, and you don't even care what, what country it's going to come from or what language it's going to be spoken or written in. Um, you're going to go for that particular thrill, and you're not going to go because you read a good review, um, or even if you read a bad review, you're going to go in this with this beginner's mind. And, and uh, yeah, so the Berlinale was the first film festival I ever went to, and I've been pretty much addicted to film festivals ever since. But to present films at a festival and to present films to an audience at a film festival is something very particular, because it's about the conversation. The conversation starts with the filmmakers and together, you know, figuring out what we're going to make, and on it goes. It's, it's not that it's ended because it ends up on a screen, the next phase of the conversation starts tonight. And Joanna, who I'm happy to say, my beloved friend Joanna Hogg, my now colleague Joanna Hogg, who's in the audience, will agree that for us it's very precious tonight. We've only just started showing our new film. Um, we started in Venice a few mm -hmm. weeks ago, and then we showed it in, in s Toronto and in London. And now we're going to show it to you tonight, or those of you who've got a ticket for tonight. Um, it's an incredibly um, emotional and vulnerable experience and tender experience because we know that you're up for newness and we brought you something new. So it's really, it's a very tender thing showing films yeah. at a film festival. 
No, I, I see that, and I, I think for the most part, when you sit down in the audience at a film festival, you want to like the film. You want to be swept up in that moment um, as, a, as an audience member. Um, and, and I like this, I just want to follow up on what you were saying, because it, it, it speaks to this question of collaboration that I want to get to with you, but it, it feels like the, the present, presentation of the film is, a, is part of the continuum, totally. basically. Um, maybe we could just, back that continuum up then a little bit, because yeah. I, I wanted to, to talk to you. You have a, 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 a really wonderful ass assortment of wonderful artists that you've worked with over many years that are collaborators. You know, Derek Jarman, of course, your, your first uh, real collaborator and uh, such a substantial one, but so many, so many. In fact, Joanna, you made a short film with her uh, in 1986. She's my first, actually. She it, came yeah. even before Derek. Yeah. Well, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and that progression of your relationship as a collaborator with Joanna. And here you, you made a film with her in 86, but then, you know, so many years later have continued that. Well, Joanna uh, is a particular case because we are the oldest of friends. We've known each other since we were children. And um, as I was uh, telling someone earlier today, I've realized that the, the value of that relationship is that in a strange way, even when we were children and when we were teenagers, long before she started taking photographs and then went to film school and I started performing in, 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 in films with Derek Jarman, we were always talking about cinema in a strange way. Even though we didn't know we were talking about cinema, we were kind of dealing in energy and we were both observers from the outside of social groups and we were beginning to do the work then that we're now making films out of. Um, and that started, that sort of fellowship was what really got me into making cinema in the first place. I don't think if I, if I hadn't met Derek Jarman and fallen into his collective world, I don't know that I would be making films, to be honest. I'm not much of a professional. I don't think that the industrial model really suits me. Well, you've learned to make it suit, it, you know, you, it suits you in the, in the way that you've made it work. The well, there are, there are more to. freaks than a few, and, yeah. and they, 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 they tend, we tend to stick together, so I'm very, I'm rich in freaks, I'm <laughs> happy to say. <laughs> um, well, and then so, uh, let's start then at this moment where you meet Derek and, and you're starting to kind of formulate a concept of yourself even as a performer. Um, he, you're part of a collective, really, is that right, with Derek? And how did you uh, emerge from that as a performer? How, wh how, when you look back at it now, because you have the, the benefit of that looking back, w w what kind of foundation did that create for you in your career? Well, I was very clear, and I, I say this quickly in case someone's heard me say this before because it's very boring to repeat but the truth is I never wanted and I still don't want to be an actor and never ever intended to be one and um, still don't intend to be one. Um, I, I, I started my life as a writer and I went to university as a writer and I'm embarrassed to say that I got my place at university as a writer and the second I arrived I stopped writing immediately <laughs> uh, which apparently is not that rare um, and I had friends who were making theatre there was no film at the time uh, at Cambridge in England where I was uh, but there was quite active uh, theatre being made and I fell in with a group of friends and they were directing and writing and being in plays and so they asked me to join in. The first thing I did was I directed a, a piece and then I started playing around mm -hmm. as a performer, never taking it seriously. They were pretty serious, a lot of them became professional directors and, and, and performers and writers but I was never really serious about it. But I did know by the time I left university that I did not want to be an actor. But I didn't know what else to do and so I just sort of fell into it again, just followed my nose a little bit, um, continuing to endorse the view that I did not want to be an actor um, and had made up my mind after a stint as a theatre actor in the Royal Shakespeare Company that I for sure didn't want to be <laughs> a theatre actor, um, that I met Derek Jarman. And I was on the verge of, of, of really throwing in the towel and I don't know doing what, when I met him. Mm -hmm. And he, what he did was he opened a world to me, not just a world of, of cinema, but a world of art, yeah. and a way of working that just made all the difference. And that is the, my drug of choice, working collectively. It could be a wool shop, 
It could be a fish factory, but that collective vibe, that's what I'm really into. And come the flood, it could be a fish factory, it could be a wool shop, whatever, if they still exist um, in the flood. But um, that's what got me into the idea of making cinema when I realized that it was a collective business. And so um, the really lucky trick was after Derek uh, left the building nine years later, um, that other people wanted to work in that way. That was really amazing, because that could have just dried up when he, when he uh, disappeared. Um, so that, that's the way of working that I know. And is that, is that solely about the creation of what the story is and what the film might be, or is that also in the process of the actual shooting of it? And you know, how, how does it extend that, that process of the collective for well you? Well, it, it slightly depends um, on, the, on the relationship and on the particular group. And I have worked as a professional occasionally. You know, sometimes people have, have, have asked me to to perform in their films that I haven't uh, been around when they've been put together and I haven't helped to raise the money or I haven't helped to you know, support them while they write the script. You know, I have worked with proper professional filmmakers you occasionally. You mean like the Marvel movies? Mm? You mean like the Marvel occasionally movies? Occasionally the Marvel studio <laughs> has called and occasionally other people, I mean, I have not sat around with the Coen brothers while they have written their scripts. They can do that without my support very easily. <laughs> All sorts of you know, extraordinary filmmakers and they've been in, in a way holidays for me but my home base is a sort of ongoing developmental relationship with a number of filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Joanna's one, uh, Luca Guadagnino is another, um, um, Bong Joon-ho has been yeah. one too, uh, Lynn Ramsey, etc. Lynn yeah. Hirschman. Lynn Hirschman, I was gonna ask you about Lynn. Um, I mean, it is wonderful to see the, w the assortment of, of filmmakers, of artists that you've worked with and who you've done multiple films with. And of course, I'm sure you walk out onto the set of a Coen Brothers movie quite differently uh, than even the Wes Anderson film or, or a Lynn Hirschman film. Um, but let's, I wanted to delve into a little into Lynn because I think she's probably the lesser known in some ways of many of your collaborators mm -hmm. and someone who's also within the, works within the world of art more mm -hmm. formally. Um, wh when did you first meet her and, and what is the, uh, how did you start your collaboration with her? Uh, Lynn Hirschman, um, and again, I don't know the dates, Leslie, I wanna say 94, something like that, five, six, um, got in touch with me um, and very cleverly sent me a link to, or no, not a link, what am I talking about? In those days, it was like a <laughs> bloody videotape of her, um, <laughs> of her VHS, of her uh, video diaries, piece, a uh, very interesting video diary piece that she made over several years. And, and, and I then completely fell in love with her work and with her. And she asked me to work with her on a film we made called Conceiving Ada, which was about Ada Lovelace, which is a really interesting piece of work. It was the first um, film actually made inside a computer. I, I hear that George Lucas asked to see it to get some ideas. Um, <laughs> from it, um, and it's a really interesting experimental uh, film about uh, the first computer programmer, uh, Ada Lovelace, who mm -hmm. was Byron's daughter, fascinating mm -hmm. individual. And then we made a film um, called Technolust, which is similarly um, uh, beyond any description, in which I play <laughs> a computer uh, nerd who secretly cyber clones herself three times. Yeah. Uh, and that was at Sundance, I seem to remember. Yeah, and many other films we've made together. And she's a really playful and truly visionary filmmaker who, who seems to know no boundaries between uh, the world of, 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 of museum art and, and, and cinema. She's, she's really sort of, she's, she's rubbed the edge of, the, of, the, of that divide. Uh, and you, that was also Techno Lust, a film where you were playing multiple characters, yeah. as you've done now in several other films as well. Yeah, yeah. well, it's never, I, I, I'm always amazed that people would be surprised that one would play multiple, um, present multiple portraits in a film. 
I, maybe I'm just so uh, influenced. I was influenced as a child by, for example, Alec Guinness in uh, Kind Hearts and Coronets. Or for that matter, uh, dare I say, Peter Sellers in uh, Kubrick's films. The feeling of, um, you know, that being an option, was it was always there for me. I, I'm, I'm curious about um, the, those opportunities you have now to, to almost disguise yourself also where you someone will watch a film almost realize at the end oh that was that was you under all of that uh, do you enjoy making those doing those roles where you're just all, all, all made up all do you hide behind that do you feel like you're hiding or does it feel like you're out you're out be able you're out more in, in when you're covered up like that I don't even know how to answer that um I don't know um it's first of all it seems completely uh, natural to me to dress up and play. I mean, I've said, I've declared many times, and here again tonight, I am not an actor. I do not know how to talk about the sort of finer ins and outs of performing. I'm not interested in performative performance at all. I mean, to, the, to a degree, actually. Um, but I do love play, and I love the idea of dressing up and playing. And I was asked relatively early, I'm trying to think who it was first, who sort of gave me the opportunity to, um, I th well, I made a one-woman show once, the one of the last, the last piece of theater I ever made before I, I stopped working in the theater was a one-woman play called Man to Man about um, uh, a, a woman in the, in, the, in the Second World War in East Germany who dresses herself up as her dead husband. And that was highly disguised and kind of punk. And I loved that. And I was covered in clay. And as I, it was like a sort of uh, stand-up show. And as I moved during the show, bits of clay fell off me. And it felt, you know, that whole grotesque aspect really got me going. And there are certain uh, filmmakers who I love to work with who love to play in that way with me. Bong Joon-ho, for example, or Wes Anderson. And to a certain extent, Luca Guadagnino. We've, we've had all sorts of adventures dressing up and, and masking. Uh, that's, that was one of the parts I was thinking about. Um, I, and I, I was curious about your, because you've made, started working with Luca, I won't give you the date, you won't remember, 1999, it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, uh, just, for, just for the sake of all of you. Um, but uh, uh, maybe you could also just talk about your relationship with him as, mm -hmm. as, a, as an artist, and that you've, you've done s different kinds of films with him. They're so different, um, each one. And, so, and what, what is it that you connect with about him as an artist, and how do you approach those, those works with him? Actually, I'm going to suggest that the first film I made with Luca was earlier than that, because I think it was 1998, because my children were toddlers, and uh, they were born in 97, so there you have it. Um, he's a friend of mine, and we started talking cinema the second we met, and we love to uh, go down the alleys of our passions, and, and we've had these amazing opportunities with I Am Love, we were able to go down a sort of Visconti fever dream passion route, and uh, when we made a bigger splash, we were somewhere else. And, uh, and, and, and then Suspiria with Dario Argento. We, we're sort of always working, I would say, to this date, uh, Luca and I have worked as sort of film geeks, really. Uh, on the projects that we've made. And I look forward, we're having all sorts of conversations now, but I'm looking forward to, to maybe making something less geeky uh, with him. But he's an extremely, uh, as we all know now, erudite and cine-literate filmmaker, and he's what I call a sensationalist, uh, and I don't mean that in a sort of uh, facile way, but he's interested in a kind of sensation-driven cinema. You know, you want to um, smell what he's putting on the screen and you want to feel it. And I think that's a kind of conversation that I'm really up for. And, and I tend to have that with him. You've worked with uh, I an independent film largely for, for a large part of your career. When did you make a transition uh, and when did that happen where you started to do, uh, you did the Michael Clayton, of course, and won the Academy Award. How did, how did all of that change for you in terms of the projects that you considered and when you consider then working independently and when you make that choice to do that? Well, it does have something to do with 
um, and this is going to be very prosaic and dull, but it's to do with time and the amount of me that's required by a project. And this has to do with life and to do with the fact that I had twins at a certain point. And there's something about uh, being in every frame of a film that one's developed with someone over several years, uh, which takes years, sometimes 20 years. And then there's a moment when one doesn't want to be away from Scotland for longer than two weeks, and one pops up for a moment uh, in a film, as I say, that one doesn't have to uh, raise the money for or support uh, the writing of the script on. And one does a little bit of performing which is, as I've said, very exotic to me. I'm still amazed that people might require me to do that or give me that opportunity. Um, and yeah, that's in a way, that's been a sort of diffusion line for me. That's my sort of plan B. And I've enjoyed it very much. It's like a sort of experiment. Who's that ringing to disagree? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's another, it's another, it's like another, it's like my left hand, if you like. But it's always fed in, and it's given me the opportunity maybe to experiment with a particular shape or experiment yeah. with a particular line uh, of material, which then I might develop deep in a more deep way over a longer period of time in another relationship. Well, it seems in the, in the modern world of the movie, business and industry, which we don't really like to think of it, but it is an industry mm -hmm. um, that has changed so much. And a lot of performers and actors and artists are uh, taking the opportunity to work in mediums where they may not have worked before, but it affords them the opportunity then to work independently as well. Um, do you find um, this tension, or is do you feel that there is a tension in any way between um, the, the sort of business uh, of filmmaking that you have to sometimes get involved with, and uh, that the, the fundraising and the, the, the work that you, you really put yourself into uh, and allow yourself to be a part of for with a filmmaker, um, and the sort of larger business of the film industry that you see. Um, you know, has that become tougher? You see the bit, uh, the gap widener, maybe is what really what I want to talk about. For me, not. I mean, the, 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 I mean, I've worked practically as a producer alongside my collaborators always. I mean, essentially, I worked as a producer with Derek in those days. Um, and I worked alongside Sally Potter and Christopher Shepard for five years while we got Orlando made. I saw, you know, really in the trenches how independent film, at a time when it was really difficult yeah. to make independent film of a, of a sort, um, of a sort um, such as Orlando, for example, which at that time was incredibly ambitious um, for people with very little, uh, you know, profile. Um, to, to really learn in the trenches about how to put together a budget and how to put together a crew and how to actually make a film over three continents in ten weeks uh, like that was an amazing opportunity. And that's something that I learned, as I say, early, and I've kind of always drawn on that knowledge and I've developed it. Um, of course, I don't have to draw on that. Uh, you know, on the you know the, the the moment that I was rung up by Marvel, I was not required to do any of that there. Um, and I don't really know because I'm working now in a much um, I'm back working in a way uh, in a much more uh, kind of home on a home turf in a more independent sphere. So um, I don't know how tough it is out there because I'm not out there. I'm with Apichetpong, where it's ethical, and Joanna Hogg, and uh, and Joshua Oppenheimer, and my other friends. So I don't know how tough it is out there, um, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm happily able to continue to work in the way that I want to work and present <laughs> our films at the New York Film Festival. You know, I'm, it, it ain't broke. I'm, I don't need to fix anything right now, so I don't feel the toughness. Um. Well, I think it's a, it, we're buoyed this year by how many people are, are, are back in our theaters and, mm -hmm. and that the experience of the theatrical experience. Mm -hmm. um, what was your experience during COVID? Did were you what what were you were you were in Scotland? Were you watching? Did you watch a lot of movies? Did you talk to a lot of your film friends during that time? Did you develop projects? The um, the the first lockdown um, was was wonderful. I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you how wonderful it was. We were in Scotland and my twins who had 
just recently left home, came back. And uh, we had a beautiful spring and summer together and we watched a lot of films and we cooked and we gardened and we walked on the beach. And then about a month after that, I started shooting and I never stopped. I have made about five films in the, in the, the succeeding two years. I f made the first COVID film with Pedro Almodovar. We made our short um, at that moment when none of us knew. I mean, there, there, there's a crew that I shot with that I wouldn't recognize without their masks. I mean, I simply wouldn't know what they looked like because we were all masked up uh, over that period. And then I made a, a film in, in Sydney with George Miller, which was COVID free at that point. Um, yeah. So that was very blessed. I made uh, The Eternal Daughter with Joanna. Um, and yeah, I never stopped. Yeah. Well, we had your Almodovar film here last year, and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about your experience with Pedro. Um, and I know you met kind of casually a bit uh, at an Oscar party, I think. Um, and how long did it take you to develop the project that you worked on, and what was your experience working on it? It was his first English language film, I believe. Yeah, well, I'm so honored to have made that film with him and, uh, and for him to be my, my fellow and my friend. I mean, it's really a, a, an, an honor. Um, he just out of the blue contacted me um, and said that he wanted to make this film and what could I say? I mean, there's really no story there, Leslie. It was <laughs> a really blessed day. Very easy to say yes to that. And he had, he had adapted this screenplay, or rather not this screenplay, this play, uh, this Cocteau piece. And it was um, very easy. Uh, he was very trepidatious. I don't think he would mind me telling you that about working it out of Spanish, um, and we, we hit on a very interesting moment when we discovered, I remember saying to him, you, d don't worry about the, the English, Pedro, let's just talk cinema. And he, he literally, w at that point, you know, there'd be a moment when he would ask me something and, and I would say, no, what, give me a reference, give me a film. And, and then we were fine, you know, we were sort of, you know, dipping and dabbing between, you know, certain, tropes or references and 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 then he was in another language and then we were all right but it was amazing yeah. it was amazing to work and i'm happy to say that we're we're working on something again together so that's fantastic yeah. um and memoria also was here last mm. year uh, and very very um extraordinary for me i remember experience of seeing it at alice tully hall um there was a choice made about the, the distri distribution of that film and um, showing it at only one film theater at a time, one week at a time. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and um, what you think that was about and what you think it accomplished and or did it. Or well, it's something that I feel very um, proud of. To, to be honest, it was something that I dreamed of months before and had sort of we, we talked about it with the great Neon who had the nerve <laughs> to put their money where their mouth was and say, yeah, we think this is a good idea for this film. And I hope for other films too, but certainly for that film. It's still playing out. I have to say, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a producer of that film and I'm happy to get monthly statements of how it's doing and it's still rolling and people are still putting that date in their calendar and waiting and going to the cinema to see that film. And it worked, and I hope it's working well for Neon financially as well, because it means they'll do it again. I think it was, um, particularly at that moment, because remember, this time yeah. last year, everyone was quite trepidatious around going into bi what I call big cinema. Yeah. And we're, we're less trepidatious this year, I'm happy to say. But there was a sort of slightly nerve-wracking moment when people were, were some people were, were wondering if this was going to be the death, if COVID was going to be the death knell of big cinema. And so to actually nail our colors to that mm -hmm. mast and say, no, this is worth something, and this is the kind of film that it is worth putting that date in your calendar, yeah. getting that ticket four months in advance, mm -hmm. sticking it on your fridge under a fridge magnet, and waiting like you would for a rock concert, making an event of it that I think has really borne fruit and has people have really, really uh, understood the value of big cinema and, 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 and Memoria has done something to help that. 
Well, I, I, I think the, the, the experience of a film like that on a big screen is indisputable and you might as well not do it if you're not gonna do it that way. And I th it's a very interesting to consider a, just a different model, right? We've used the same model for so long for this theatrical uh, experience and changing it up is, I think, a really wonderful yeah, thing well, as I mean, well. I do go back to rock and roll for that. I think it's such a good, that's such a, that's the paradigm that I go to. I mean, you know, we, 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 we hear a, a, a new album, we, we well, in the, again, back, back I am in the CDs and the <laughs> vinyl, but, you know, we, we get off Spotify a new, um, a, a link to a new album and we get to know it and we love it. But when that band comes to our town, do we not go and see it because we know the album? No, we do. It's something different and it's yeah. worth it. And knowing, knowing a film, having watched it on your, on your phone or having watched it in the back of a, a, an airline seat um, doesn't mean, I mean, it's okay. You know, these screens, they can be many different sizes, yeah. but as long as they don't count that thing out, we're gonna be all right. Yeah. And we just have to keep, going for the experience. And Memoria is, again, rather like what I was saying about Luca, it's such a sensational experience, Memoria. Exactly you right. need not only a nice big screen, but you need a great sound system. Um, and you might have seen it on a smaller screen at the end of your bed. That's okay, but you will get more out of it yeah. later on, maybe, if you go and see it in a big cinema. No, absolutely right. What, what um, are there projects that you're working on now that are going to that are slowly being developed like like that? I know it took 15 years for that project to be developed. Or do you have other ones that you're working on that way? Yeah, I I I, I always say I feel a bit like a farmer. You know, you sort of <laughs> plant these things, and and some of them take a long time to come up, up, and sometimes they shoot up really fast, and sometimes they don't come up at all. Um, but yeah, I got some long ones in the ground. Mm -hmm. And they're just, you know, they're, they're just taking their time. I'm not worried about the long gestation. Yeah. I, I have a good track record of, uh, of, of staying the course or, and being alongside my colleagues who have stayed the course with, with things. I think uh, I Am Love was something like 12 years. And, and what was, oh, I'm going next Sunday. I fly to Fiji to make a film with my friend uh, Cynthia Beat that we've been talking about since 1986. Yeah. That's the record. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do it. We're actually going to do it. Yeah. So there you have Maybe it. Maybe next year. We'll see that here. Maybe. All right. Maybe. Um, well, when, when you're thinking about um, projects for yourself and thinking about your future and, you know, what do you think about the next 10 years and where do you see yourself and, and, the, and, the, and what you're going to endeavor to do beyond uh, the performing? I but like that question because I've been recently asking myself and I've come up with a sort of vague first draft of an answer, um, which is I, you know, we talk of our children, uh, those children, COVID's over, they've gone again. Um, I can go out into the deep dive with someone like Joanna, with Apachat Ponga, et cetera, cool, um, uh, with Luca, with Pedro, and I can develop big, long, chunky projects again, which there were some years that I, I didn't want to commit to, to, to that sort of model. So that's really uh, what I'm in now. Um, I'm, I'm back in this beautiful deep dive phase, and I don't know how long it's going to go on for. Um, I suppose till all the crops are in. I, I, I don't know how many more I want to plant, though, because I don't want to go on forever. Um, I, I, I would quite like to um, maybe write again <laughs> when I stop being distracted. Um, but I think, um, yeah, back into these long, deep uh, conversations um, with the friends and colleagues that I value so, so dearly. And, and yeah, I have enough. But uh, as you've gotten older, do you find that that time to recuperate is important and refresh? The ref it's more the reset, the reset button. Do you have that time, or are you able to do that? And how important is it as you're going from project to project? I'm giggling because I know there are people in the audience who've been trying to make me factor that in, and um, they know who they are. Um, well, the the problem with the farmer, the problem with my crops 
is that they do tend to dovetail yeah. um, and things aren't so neat. It's not like school terms. Right. It doesn't sort of go chk, vacation, um, seemingly. In my world, it doesn't. So I tend to kind of, you know, something comes up and it's a bit like the Galapagos Islands, you know, it sort <laughs> of comes, comes up and then it goes down and then something else comes up. So yeah, looking for those patches is uh, definitely something I'm yeah. very keen on. Um, more of. I wanted to ask you a question about working with honor and yes. what that was like and um, your experience working on Souvenir 1 and 2, which was a also a more personal story mm -hmm. of Joanna's and knowing your personal connection to her. Um, and, I, and, and just an honor, just there she is, right? I mean, she was remarkable in this film, uh, both of them. Um, what, what, were, what were your expectations and um, what was your experience like working with her? Well, and it Joanna. Was, it was a very, very peculiar situation because Joanna had told me several months earlier that she wanted to approach making a film about this period in her life, which I, which I had been a part of myself. So I knew, I knew the territory. And she asked me if I would like to play essentially her mother, and I knew her mother well, so I, I was very happy to, to say that yes to that. And the weeks went by. And I would ask her occasionally, how are you getting on finding the girl? And she said, oh, well, you know, it's quite tricky. And I'm, I don't want an actress, and I don't want someone who wants to be an actress. I want a real person who's not a kind of selfie girl. And I want someone who <laughs> could potentially feel like she was a film student in the 80s, which is a very particular brief, you know. And there aren't that many of them around these days. And. Um, so on it went and on it went. And I remember going through the rigmarole of, of giving her the names of all sorts of, of honors friends. And it never occurred to me uh, that this child of mine who was just finishing school um, would be the person. But then I have to confess, it was me who had this strange thought. And I knew that if the second it was out of my mouth, it would have to happen. Um, so I sort of sat on it for a while. And then there were about three weeks to go before the start of shooting, so I finally, it popped out of my mouth, and, and there she was. And I was concerned because as a mother, I was not something that I necessarily, you know, Anna wasn't talking about performing. She had never, you know, she, she was in school plays and things, but she didn't, you know, it wasn't something that she was wanting to pursue. But I did know, I mean, as a filmmaker, to be honest with you, I knew she'd be perfect. I knew it would be really good for the film. <laughs> so that was a little tension in me. But I also knew that if she was going to ever be in a film, um, to be in a film with Joanna, who's her godmother, and with me, you know, it doesn't get much cozier. Um, <laughs> so, and then I thought, life, you know, life, life, life. And I thought, what if she finds out when she's 35 that there was that possibility and that I didn't give her this opportunity. So I thought, oh God, I don't think I can face that reproach. <laughs> but she was perfect, as we know. And yeah. so she just stepped into it with this beautiful spirit <clears throat> of openness. And the way in which Joanna works, as you may know, um, which is to, she works within a framework of what she wants to, to achieve, but within the scenes, her performers are um, free to improvise. Right. Uh, so it was a sort of game, I think, for Honor, for this young person. She didn't have to learn any lines. There was no getting it wrong, you know? Right. And, uh, and so she just, she just bloomed into it. It was beautiful. And then she went away, as she'd planned to, to be a volunteer in, in Namibia, a volunteer teacher, and came back after that, knowing that she had to make the second film. And that was slightly different, I think, because she'd grown up a fair bit. But, uh, and had to pretend that she hadn't, because she was supposed to be like two days later. Uh, <laughs> but no, it was beautiful, beautiful experience. And she's now, I spoke to her today, and she's just doing a huge essay in her final year of her psychology degree at Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah. You, with no interest in pursuing this, or who knows? Pursuing what? <laughs> <laughs> pursuing life, yeah. Yes, really pursuing interested life. in pursuing life. Well, I think about uh, that, what you just described as a f first experience for, for any performer to work both with you and Joanna, but that experience of the, um, 
uh, choosing your, you know, choosing the the sort of direction of your own character almost yeah. within a scene by virtue of what your connection is with that person and moving that narrative forward um, through your own volition and what feels real to you, um, and that certainly feels the way that it is on the screen. Well, it's really interesting because she was she has always been a writer, also. And it, it does this way of working does call on the writer in one, yep. you know, and 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 uh, and the the editor to a certain extent, <laughs> and in a certain way also the poet because because the material of that way of working is what might I say, and what can I get away with not saying, which I think is a very poetic impulse. And um, she got the measure of it very fast. And I, and I see that as, as the writer in her um, really sort of responding to that way of working. Do you ever think about directing films yourself? Um, yes, and then, I, and then I stop thinking about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, all right, I won't, I'm not going to... There's no follow-up. There's no follow-up to that. There's... <laughs> Well, it, I, it feels that you um, are choosing your projects with your heart and with your soul and with your with your intellect and and with your with the part of yourself also that wants to follow your own continuum uh, as a, as a filmmaker and as an artist. Uh, are, are there are there filmmakers and other artists that you want to work with that you haven't worked with? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure there are many. Um, I. I, and they will presumably make themselves known. I mean, that's the way it seems to be working. It's For me, it's like a sort of breadcrumb trail through the forest. I mean, I say it, it may sound like I'm being flippant or, or, or silly when I say that I never intended to do any of this. But I actually believe it, it's very helpful as a sort of modus operandi because it means that, you know, you can't get it wrong. You're just continuing to, it's like a mystery and you're um, just following your nose into the next adventure, the next. I made a good decision for me early on, which was to, to, to rest myself in my relationships, my working relationships, and, and that suits me very well. And out of those relationships, those intimate relationships, come these deep conversations and come these kind of shared curiosities. And so that's why it's interesting to me. If I wasn't this interested, I have a very, very, very low boredom threshold. Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't that interested, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be doing something else. But, but it's that level of conversation that keeps me going. You know, Every time I make a film, I intend it to be my last one. And it's only when there's a good conversation going with someone like Joanna or Joey Apachepong or, or Luca or Pedro, oh, well, that would be, how would that be? Question mark, question mark, question mark, <laughs> mystery, mystery, mystery. That keeps me going, yeah. you know? I have a couple, just a couple more questions, but one, I wasn't even sure how to ask this question exactly, but let me just say, but what role does fashion play in your life? What, what you, what, what, how do you feel about fashion and, and, and its connection to art and photography and, and the film work that you do? And how does it connect to your, yourself as, as a person and how you want to express yourself? Fashion itself, I'm fairly ignorant of um, and not really involved in. Um, I've always been really interested in making images and I work closely with certain photographers and love that work. I find it, you know, it's a, it's a short step sideways from cinema, this sense of filling a frame. And in many ways, I think, practically speaking, it's uh, useful for, for, the, for my practice as a filmmaker um, to work sometimes with still frames. Um, making shapes and uh, what I call schmutter and the feeling of, um, you know, fantasy, I love. I love, 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 and always have, and it does feel, as I say, some kind of ancillary, uh, supportive practice. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I mean, again, but my relationship with that world is entirely based on my relationship with certain individuals. I just happen to know some, some of my friends make great clothes, and I'm lucky enough to be um, 
given the opportunity to wear them. But it's not, it's nothing I'm chasing. And fashion as such, certainly in terms of the sort of rondelay of, of seasons and trends, count me well out. I have no idea. How does it make you feel um, but to be the muse of fashion designers and even photographers? And uh, do you enjoy that aspect of, of it yourself in terms of how it makes you feel in, in that way? Well, if, if, if I am or if I could be described as such, it's all you know, grist to the same fellowship mill. It's a lovely thing to be in, in cahoots. And when I make pictures with photographers that I, that I have friendships with, and we, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out the scheme for a shoot together, mm -hmm. it's, it's bliss, I love it. And, and again, you know, in terms of wearing clothes, I'm a shy individual and going out in public is not my chosen field, but if I'm gonna wear something made by my great friend, who might actually be just out of eye shot just over there, you know, um, while I'm walking up and down a, a, a piece of red floor, then that's just better than being by myself, uh, feeling exposed. I like to, I like to be in a group. I'm not very good at being singled out, to be honest. Well, you, in some ways, though, and in not some ways, in many ways, of course, this is also a wonderful support you give to them, well, also as artists. Yeah, well, it cu cuts both ways. That's yeah. why it's called fellowship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, one last question, it's the most important. Um, do your dogs get jealous of each other when one goes in a movie and the other one is not in the film? That, that, that's a really, really good and really important question. <laughs> and for those who are going to see The Eternal Daughter, I want to prepare you for a great revelation. Because for those of you who've seen the souvenir films, the first souvenir featured, starred, let's say, uh, let's admit, uh, Rosie, the matriarch, and her sister Dora. And then the souvenir two featured Rosie and Dora a little older, and Rosie's grandson, Snow Bear. But, drum roll, the eternal daughter um, reveals uh, Louis. <laughs> Louis Rose's son and the uncle of Snow Bear and uh, he needed a film of his own. I remember there was a moment when, uh, when Joanna and I were, were talking about who should be in the second souvenir and I was thinking of, of Louis and then I thought no we have to keep him back. He is not <laughs> He, you know, he's not, not part of a, of a, of a group. He needs no. to have his own moment. So in answer to your question about how it is for him, I, I will say when <laughs> Joanna brought the film to Scotland a couple of weeks ago to show to some friends of ours who otherwise wouldn't be able to travel to see a screening, and we um, took a, the, the, our local uh, art cinema screening room very kindly, gave us this screening, and Louis came to see the film. <laughs> And um, he was so happy because, not that he could appreciate the film, let's be real, but because he was alone again. <laughs> because right. he was alone, he was away from the pack. Mm -hmm. And he really, really loved it and was, was, was happier making that film yeah. than at any other time of his life. <laughs> I think if you see the film tonight, you will understand and appreciate the full screen credit he gets also, by the way. I'm pretty sure he has his own card, if I'm not. He certainly does. He certainly does. So there's, he's got a big head now, really. So it well, no, he's just, it's in a way, it's uh, Joanna's and my homage to Ohazar Balthazar. Yeah. He has this uh, sense. But, uh, and my friend Vivian Bond saw the film last week and, and sent me a text saying, Lassie who? <laughs> Well, I could not end on a greater note than that. I want to thank Tilda Swinton. Thank you. That's awesome.